Take your Bibles and turn to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 1. The book of Jeremiah, chapter 1. Thank you, praise team. Thank you, Ashley. I'm excited about what we're going to talk about Today, as we continue our series on what you believe, and of course, uh, in this series, we are looking at major doctrines uh, in the Bible, things that we need to be uh, thoughtful of as uh, not only in our individual lives, but as a church. And, you know, some of these things we look at and we might not think that they're all that important until the time comes when we need them. And so uh, these are things that help us to build a foundation uh, as it pertains to our faith and really, you know, helps us to, as we saw in the video just a few moments ago, it helps us to really be able to bring all of the stuff, you know, to the cross, all of the things that uh, are crazy in our lives, all of the things that stress us out. And so... And so, uh, the book of Jeremiah, uh, chapter 1, and let's go, Lord, in prayer as we begin today. Father, thank you for your goodness to us, and Lord, I just thank you for this church. I thank you for what you are doing in our midst, Lord. I thank you for uh, all of those who serve so faithfully here. God, I thank you for every person who chose to get up this morning and come to this place early on purpose because they love you. And so, God, I pray that your hand of blessing would be upon uh, this message, Lord, as we look into your word. Help us, Lord, to uh, become greater disciples of you. And we'll be so careful to thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, on a dangerous seacoast, 
notorious for shipwrecks. There was a crude little life-saving station. Actually, the station was merely a hut with only one boat. But the few devoted members kept a constant watch over the turbulent sea. With little thought for themselves, they would go out day and night tirelessly searching for those in danger as well as the lost. Many, many lives were saved by this brave band of men and women who faithfully worked as a team in and out of the life-saving station. By and by, it became a famous place, and some of those who had been saved as well as others along the seacoast wanted to become associated with this little station. They were willing to give their time and energy and money <clears throat> in support of its objectives. New boats were purchased, new crews were trained. The station that was once obscure and crude and virtually insignificant began to grow. Some of its members were unhappy that the hut was so unattractive and poorly equipped. They felt a more comfortable place should be provided. Emergency cots were replaced with lovely furniture. Rough handmade equipment was discarded and sophisticated, classy systems were installed. The hut, of course, had to be torn down to make room for all of the additional equipment, furniture, systems, and appointments. By its completion, the life-saving station had become a popular gathering place, and its objectives had begun to shift. It was now used as sort of a clubhouse, an attractive building for public gatherings, Saving lives, feeding the hungry, strengthening the fearful, and calming the disturbed rarely occur occurred now. Fewer members were now interested in braving the sea on life-saving missions, so they hired professional lifeboat crews to do this work. The original goal of the station wasn't altogether forgotten, however. The life-saving motifs still prevailed in the club's decorations. In fact, there was a liturgical lifeboat preserved in the Room of Sweet Memories with soft, indirect lighting which helped to hide the layer of dust upon the once-used vessel. About this time, a large ship was wrecked off the coast, and the boat crews brought in loads of cold, wet, half-drowned people. They were dirty, some terribly sick and lonely, Others were different from the majority of the club members. The beautiful new club suddenly became messy and cluttered. A special committee saw to it that a shower house was immediately built outside and away from the club so victims of the shipwreck could be cleaned up before coming inside. At the next meeting, there were strong words and angry feelings which resulted in a division among the members. Most of the people wanted to stop the club's life-saving activities and all involvements with the shipwrecked victims. It's too unpleasant. It's a hindrance to our social life. It's opening the door to folks who are not our kind. As you'd expect, some still insisted upon saving lives, that this was their primary objective, that their only reason for existence was ministering to anyone needing help, regardless of their club's beauty or size or decorations. But they were voted down and told if they wanted to save the lives of various kinds of people who were shipwrecked in those waters, they could begin their own life-saving station down the coast. And so they did. As years passed, the new station experienced the same old changes. It evolved into another club, and yet another life-saving station was begun. History continued to repeat itself, and if you visit that coast today, you'll find a large number of exclusive and impressive clubs along the shoreline, owned and operated by slick professionals who have lost all involvement with the saving of lives. Shipwrecks still occur in those waters, but now most of the victims are not saved. Every day they drown at sea, and so few seem to care. 
This morning, um, we're going to talk about the idea of purpose. And when we think about purpose, it should cause us to ask what God's purpose is for our lives personally. We wonder if God really has time to consider us. I mean, you know, God is busy, right? I mean, God has a lot going on. Why would God take the time to devise a plan for my life? Why would God be concerned about the affairs of mankind and have a will for each and every one of us as we commit our lives to him? In our story, we hear how easy it was for an institution that was created to save lives to go astray and eventually forsake the very cause for which it was created. And likewise, any church that has been established for the proclamation of the gospel to save people before it's too late can lose its purpose and drift into mediocrity if we are not careful. And so this morning, I want us to look at the life of Jeremiah because God had a great purpose for Jeremiah. And by looking at his life, we can better understand the great purpose that God has for you and for me as well. And so a first thought that I would like for us to consider this morning is this thought, and that is finding your kingdom purpose. Finding your kingdom purpose. And if you have your Bibles open to Jeremiah 1, I want us to look at verses 4 and 5. The Bible says, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you, I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Now, we often like to look at this portion of Scripture, oftentimes in January when we think of the sanctity of life, and I think this is a perfect Scripture to to use with regards to the sanctity of life, but it's also interesting because When we think about this idea of purpose, we know that it has something to do with the Great Commission because the reality is if if it didn't have something to do with the Great Commission, then there would be no reason for God to leave us here after we get saved, right? I, I mean, once you got saved, once you put your trust and faith in Christ, it would make sense for God just to take us up to be with Him. There would be no need to stay here. But that's not what, the, uh, what God does. God, once we put our trust and faith in, in Christ, God puts us to work. God gives us his great commission so that we can reach others for Jesus Christ. We also know that God's purpose for our life is somehow connected to the church because uh, the church has been entrusted with the message of hope in Jesus Christ. Now, God told Jeremiah that he knew him before he was born. I want you to stop and and think about that for a second. I want you to think about what that means. God says, Jeremiah, I knew you before you were even born. That means that, that, that God had Jeremiah in his mind... Before he was ever created, God had Jeremiah in his mind. He knew exactly who Jeremiah was going to be. God could look down through the annals of time and he could know what was going to take place in Jeremiah's life. And God said, Jeremiah, not only do I know you before you've even been born, but he says, and I'm paraphrasing, but he's saying, but I have a plan For your life. I have a plan for your life. I have ordained you to be my prophet. Now, why is that so important? 
It's important because if God had a plan for Jeremiah's life, listen, before he was ever born, then that tells me that he has, and especially as children of God, that tells me that God has a plan for you and for me as well. Amen? And by the way, he had it before we were ever born. God has a plan for you and for me. Now, at that time, God spoke directly to Jeremiah, but we understand that today God speaks uh, clearly through his Bible, and the Bible says that we are to tell others about Jesus Christ. You might want to write this down, Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, and to work through the local church, and we see that in Hebrews 10 and verse 25. And so I ask us again this morning, what is God's purpose for you? What is God's purpose for me? And, and let's see if, 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 we can, uh, if we can help by looking at some of the purposes of the church. Because if our purpose is going to be tied to the church, then let's look at some of the things that are supposed to take place in the church. First of all, and, and by the way, I, I, like to, I, like, I like to use an acrostic when I talk about this. And you might want to write this down because this will be a blessing to you if you write it down. The acrostic that I like to use is the word wisdom, okay? The word wisdom. And so we're going to look at, you know, the different thoughts behind that word wisdom, okay? And so the first word... Uh, that, that would be represented by W in wisdom is, is the word worship, okay, the word worship. And the question is here, do you love to praise God and protect the holiness of Almighty God? Then you might work well within the purpose of worship. The I stands for intercession, Okay, and when we talk about intercession, we're talking about prayer. Intercession literally means to pray for others. And so I would ask you, do you spend a great deal of time in prayer and encouraging other Christians? If that is the case, then you might work well within the purpose of intercession. The next word is serve or service. Do you have a heart to serve? Are you one of the ones who stay behind after the fellowship to wash dishes and stack chairs? Do you look for ways to figure out problems? Then you might work well within the purpose of service. The next word is discipleship. Do you have a desire to disciple others through the teaching of God's Word? Do you enjoy helping people to learn new things about God and His Word? Then you might work well within the purpose of discipleship. Next, do you have a sense of urgency when it comes to resolving conflict? This would be the word oneness, okay? And oneness has to do with unity. Do you enjoy getting people together and building relationships? You might work well within the purpose of oneness. The final word is missions. Do you feel brokenhearted about the lost and dying world when you look at Faces, do you see the souls of people that will spend eternity somewhere? Then you might work well within the purpose of missions. Now, you might say, Pastor Polston, um, and think, you know, worship, intercession, service, discipleship, oneness, and missions. You might say, Pastor, shouldn't we be doing all of those things? And the answer to that question is yes, we should be doing all of those things. I'm just simply saying that there might be uh, you know, God may be drawing you to a particular area of service in a special way that he wants you to be involved in in the church, okay? Uh, you know, I thank God that, you know, just a, a few moments ago, uh, you know, uh, the ladies were up here singing, and I, I'm thankful that my daughter was up here singing. But I've got to tell you, she didn't, she didn't learn to sing from her dad, right? Uh, you know, I don't, you know, 
If I were if I were to get up here and grab a microphone and start singing, everybody would leave, right? Uh, you know, that's not something that God has called me to, but it may be something that God has called you to in the area of, of, of worship. You know, maybe, it, maybe it's service, and you're kind of one of those behind-the-scenes people. That's how my wife is. Crystal is a behind-the-scenes person. If she's called to be, you know, out in the forefront, then she'll do it, but she doesn't like it. She would rather be behind the scenes helping people. She would be, she would be, uh, or rather be making meals and taking them to people's uh, homes when they're sick. That's, that's the kind of person that she is. And so I'm just simply saying, you know, when we look at these different, these purposes of the church, you know, ask yourself, God, which one of these things maybe am I drawn to in a special way? Here are some questions that you can ask. When you serve in one of these areas, do you see spiritual fruit? Do you see spiritual fruit? Okay? Uh, how do you feel when you serve in one of these areas? Do you enjoy it or does it feel like a shoe that doesn't fit quite right? Have others affirmed you in your service? They can see that God is using you in a particular area in the church. Is there a need in the area that you feel drawn to serve in? Okay? If, if you say, well, I, I feel drawn to this particular area, and you look and you see that there's definitely a need, then maybe that's God telling you, I, I want you to serve in this particular area. I want you to meet that need. And, and then how open are you to the things that are going on around you? And see, this is something that we need to understand. In just a, a moment, we're going to talk about spiritual gifts. But, 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 but please understand, if, if God is drawing you to a particular area of service in the church, God is going to bless you in that area. And, and it's not just going to be evident to you, it's going to be evident to everybody. And, and here's the thing, if God is in it, then please understand the Holy Spirit of God is going to get behind whatever you're doing. And you might, you know, God may be calling you to teach. And, and this, this may be how you know that, that God is working, because you might get up to, 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 to teach, and when you do, do then you s s s s stutter, and yet, and you walk away from it, and you say, that was horrible. I just, I was so nervous. I did such a terrible job, and someone comes up to you after the class that you teach, and they say, that was, that was one of the most unbelievable uh, lessons I've ever learned. That was, that was life-changing. And you say to yourself, I don't get it. You know, as far as I'm concerned, I just laid a big egg. You know, I did terrible. But see, the people that were listening to you, they didn't see it or hear it that way because as you were speaking to that person on the outside, the Holy Spirit of God was confirming what you were saying to them on the inside, okay? And so, you know, that's one of the ways that you know that God is, is working and possibly calling you to a particular area. And, and, and the, the, the beautiful thing about it is that when God is working and you respond to the call that God has on your life for the area of service that he wants you to be involved in, and I, I respond and then someone else responds, then, then we're all able to work together. Amen? And that's how the church works. It's not one person doing everything. It's not even a staff of people that are doing everything. It's not about, hey, let's, ha let's, let's hire some professional Christians, right? And then they can take care of everything. Hey, listen, that's not what it's about. It's about everybody 
being involved. Amen? It's every member being a minister. That's what it's all about. I was reading an incredible story several years ago. Two students graduated from the Chicago Kent College of Law. The highest ranking student in the class was a blind man named Overton. And when he received his honor, he insisted that half of the credit should go to his friend, Kasperzak, who had no arms. Listen to this. They had met one another in school when the armless Mr. Kasperzak had guided the blind Mr. Overton down a flight of stairs. This acquaintance uh, ripened into a friendship and, and an, a beautiful example of interdependence. The blind man carried the books which the armless man read aloud in their common study, and thus the individual deficiency of each was compensated for by the other. And after graduation, they went into law practice together. That's how the church is supposed to work. Amen? Hey, listen. I don't know anybody who is proficient in everything in the church. Jesus would have been the only one, right? But God works in the church and he draws us to particular areas of service. And I'm simply saying, be willing to be open and don't just say to yourself, you know, and maybe it's just a, it's, you're trying to be humble. You know, you're, you're trying to uh, not say, well, I, you know, I've, I've got it all together. I can, I can do this. And, and you're trying to be humble for, before the Lord and that's great. But God wants all of us to serve. God wants all of us to serve. And whatever it is that you feel that God is leading you to, maybe that's exactly what God is calling you to. And that leads us to another thought this morning, and that is finding your kingdom gifts and abilities. Finding your kingdom gifts and abilities. Look at verses 6 through 8. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, Behold, I cannot speak, for I am a youth. Look at this. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am a youth, for you shall go to all to whom I send you. Whatever I command you, you will speak. And do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Another way to confirm your purpose is to serve according to your giftedness. Listen, this is going to sound possibly wrong, but it's not. Your God-given natural abilities. Serving according to your spiritual giftedness and your God-given natural abilities. This is where we are moving to in the church. This is our goal, is that we understand what our spiritual giftedness is. Everybody, when you put your trust and faith in Christ and the Holy Spirit of God comes to live inside of you, everybody is given at least one spiritual gift. Now, maybe, maybe God has blessed you with more than one spiritual gift, and that's, that's fantastic. But everyone is given at least one spiritual gift. And you might say here today, well, Pastor Polston, that's great, man. I want to know what my spiritual gift is. And I would say to you, God will show you what your spiritual gift is, but in order for him to show you, you have to be busy serving because that's how God shows you. You say, God, show me my gift and I'll serve. God says, start serving and I'll show you your spiritual gift. And so, you know, maybe, you know, say, you know BS is coming and you say, uh, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to volunteer to help out with Vacation Bible School. I've never done it before. Uh, this will be a new thing for me, but I'm going to volunteer. I, you know, for some reason, I just feel like maybe I should volunteer. So, 
So you go to Dana and say, Dana, I'd like to volunteer for BBS. And, and well, what would you be interested in? And so, you know, maybe you share and, and, uh, and, and, and you get involved with Vacation Bible School. Maybe you get involved, uh, you know, helping out with the snacks. Or maybe you help out with games. Or, you know, maybe uh, you're allowed to teach. And God sees what you're doing and God blesses that in a special way, and you come away from that and you say, you know, I, I really enjoyed that. And, 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 and I would even be willing to say that, you know, I feel, a, I feel a strong pull to that particular area that maybe this is something that God wants me to do. It's amazing when you, you talk to people and they talk about their service to the Lord, and they'll say, you ask, well, how did you, how did you get involved with this? You know, and they'll tell you their story. I, I, one of my favorite stories is when you talk to Doyle. Doyle's always in the second service, but when you talk to Doyle and how he got involved with the cry of Christ, and I'm sure he shared that story with many of you, you know, but, but it's amazing how you get involved, and, and maybe you're just helping out, and then God begins to tug on your heart and begins to say, you know, this is, this is something I would like for you to be involved with. And, and you start to see the spiritual fruit that comes from you being involved uh, with those things. And so you'll know that it's a spiritual gift because it will be apart from your natural abilities, okay? Again, I want to be careful here. Nothing wrong with natural abilities. We're going to talk about that in, in just a moment. But God does give you spiritual gifts. And I would say, and this is me talking, but I believe that we're supposed to put our spiritual gifts before our natural abilities, but that does not negate our natural abilities. You might, you might say, well, Pastor, do our natural abilities even count? Do they even count? And the, and the reason we have our time is because it's natural. So, you know, when we think about natural, we think of maybe worldly, or we think of what we have when we were born. But we tend to think, okay, but later when I get saved and the Holy Spirit comes in and I, I get spiritual gifts, well, that's spiritual, but the other was natural. So does the natural even count? And I would say yes. Yes. It does count. Because stop and think about it. Did God know that you were going to get saved? Yes or no? Yes, God knew before you were even born. Isn't that what we just saw with Jeremiah? Before you were even formed in your mother's womb, before you were born, I knew you. God knew that Jeremiah, if you want to say he was going to be saved or that he was going to have faith in God, God knew that. And God knew that you were going to be saved, that you were going to put your trust in Jesus Christ before you ever did it, before you were ever born. So, so think about it. Does it make sense that God would give you abilities, natural abilities, knowing that you were going to get saved one day, and then say, now when you get saved, you need to put those natural abilities away. You need to never use those abilities ever again. That doesn't make sense. God knew that you were going to get saved, and God gave you those natural abilities for a reason. Okay? Let's see, who can I pick on? Um, I'll pick on faith. Okay? Sorry, faith. But, um, you know, uh, you know, Faith, faith has abilities in karate. Is it karate or taekwondo? Karate, okay. So she has abilities in karate, right? I wouldn't want to mess with her, okay? Uh, now, 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 here's the thing. Man, imagine, imagine how many young people, how many young people's lives you could impact with something like that. Imagine how many people who maybe were coming to like a self-defense class and, and you would be able to, uh, you know, uh, teach self-defense, but also uh, weave in the gospel and be able to share the Lord with people. 
You know what I'm saying? So I'm just simply saying that's a natural ability that somebody has, but that natural ability can be taken and used for the Lord. Now, all of our natural abilities may be different. You, God gave you an ability in a particular area that maybe he didn't give me and vice versa, but I'm simply saying whatever it is that God has given you, whatever spiritual gift that God has given you and whatever natural abilities that God has given you, decide on purpose that you're going to use them to share the gospel with people. And man, what could God do here at Hellsford Baptist Church if, if he had an army of people that would go out with that mindset? And so now the next time, we saw this, we talked about this on Wednesday night, but now the next time you go on your job, that you don't see your job simply uh, as a place where, you know, you make money, but you see it as the mission field that God has placed you in or the neighborhood that God has placed you in to reach people with the gospel for Jesus Christ. I want to close with this because the Holy Spirit wants to work through you and through me. There was a, an evangelist by the name of Charles Finney and maybe you've heard of Charles Finney. He, he used to have, um, he would have these, these incredible revivals. And, you know, we talk about altar calls and people responding during the invitation. That actually started with Charles Finney, you know. And he would have these big tent meetings and the sawdust trail and all of that. And people would walk the aisle. I want you to listen to what Charles Finney Finney said, and then we'll close. He's talking about how God would give him these mighty infillings of the Holy Spirit. And he said, these infillings, he said, that, that they went through me. He says, as it seemed, body and soul, I immediately found myself endued with such power from on high that a few words dropped here and there to individuals were the means of their immediate conversion. My words seemed to fasten like barbed arrows in the souls of men. They cut like a sword. They broke the heart like a hammer. Multitudes can attest to this. Sometimes I would find myself in a great measure empty of this power. I would go and visit and find that I made no saving impression, I would exhort and pray with the same results. I would then set apart a day for private fasting and prayer, and after humbling myself and crying out for help, listen, the power would return upon me with all of its freshness. This has been the experience of my life. What is he saying? And sisters in Christ, this power that was available to Charles Finney is available to you and me as well. How would you like it if you were speaking to somebody and talking to them about Jesus and your words cut to the heart, your words your words had the Holy Spirit of God resting upon them and you were able to reach multitudes for the kingdom. Hey, listen, we can have that. Every one of, that, uh, of us can have that. By the way, even though we already have the Holy Spirit of God living inside of us, all of us are commanded to pray for the power of the Holy Spirit. He wants to fill us in every way. And I just want to encourage us as we leave here today, stop and th uh, think it through. The God of the universe who knows your future and mine created you with these abilities and he has given you spiritual gifts knowing that one day you would use them for his glory. And again, I don't want to spend too much time with this, but it would be very easy to look up the different spiritual gifts. 
You have the gift of administration, the gift of discernment, encouragement, evangelism, faith, giving, helps, leadership, mercy, uh, ministering, teaching and preaching, and wisdom. And as you begin to know your spiritual gifts, I believe that God wants you to understand how it fits with your purpose in this church. And how sad it would be for you to identify your spiritual gift, see where God could use you to serve in the church and then turn away from the leading of the Holy Spirit of God. Everyone should know what their spiritual gift is and how to use it in the body of Christ. And I would just say this as we close, and some people have already taken advantage of this, but you can go on to uh, healthsford.com, and some of you have already taken the spiritual gifts assessment. And if you've never done that before, I would encourage you, it's under the section on service, and if you'll go on there and you'll take that assessment, it'll give you a really great idea of where your spiritual gifts most likely lie. And, and that would give you a, a, a good way of understanding how God may possibly want you to serve here in his church. And so let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. And with heads bowed and eyes closed, let me just ask you a couple of questions. And then we're going to have our invitation hymn. Number one, have you identified your purpose before God and how evangelism fits into that purpose? And second, have you identified your spiritual gifts and how they can be used to reach people for Jesus Christ? Let's all stand.